Hello, I'm Jamila Musayeva, an international social etiquette consultant and an author of two books, Etiquette, The Least You Need to Know and Afternoon Tea Etiquette. Except I'm not, but my guest is... <laughs> Hi, I'm Jamila Musaiva, an international social etiquette consultant and author of two etiquette books, Etiquette, The Least You Need to Know and Afternoon Tea Etiquette. Today in this video, I have my very special guest, my friend Leila, that you've probably already seen on my Instagram page as well on YouTube posts. Uh, we have been planning to do this Q&A for a really long time. So Leila is going to interview me, asking me questions that you have asked on Instagram as well as YouTube. I would like to talk a little bit about Leila. She is my friend. We've been friends for about four years now. Uh, she's the original Instagram blogger that I've always admired. Her Instagram page is called Always Hungry Baku. Uh, she launched it in 2015. Um, at that time, I had no blog, I had no idea about having a public profile, but Leila was the first one to do so, and she was really big in Baku. And she's also the first one to launch her own podcast, got always inspired Baku, and she was the first one to actually interview me. Back then, I didn't have my YouTube uh, channel, I didn't have a public Instagram page, or maybe I did, but it wasn't really big. And I just had written my first book, so it wasn't really a big deal, but she believed in me and she thought, that I was an emerging public persona so she invited me over to her podcast and I truly appreciated her um, efforts and I truly appreciated her friendship and that she believed in me and she really instilled a lot of confidence in me. So that is why I think she's the perfect interviewer for this Q&A because she has been with me throughout this whole journey with YouTube as well as my Instagram public page so I'm really happy to have her. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jamila, for having me. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm actually really honored to be here with you today and to have this opportunity to interview you for the second time. And I want to thank your audience for really cool questions. Um, it was actually, as Jamila said, she was, um, she was my very first guest on my own podcast when I just started podcasting in Baku. And um, I think you were the first one mm -hmm. ever I ever interviewed. So for me, it was a whole new experience and um, I thank you for joining my project back in the days. Um, and now I'm joining yours and it's, it's truly an honor for me. Thank you. So let's get started. Let's get started. Um, I actually am very old school, so I have my questions written down in my little notebook, not a phone. <laughs> so let me open this. Okay, so Jama, the first question is, um, three words you would use to describe yourself? That's a really good question. I've never thought about myself in three words, but I guess if I were to only use three, I want to say human, loving and caring. I would say the same things about you. Thank you. Um, three core things you took away from your childhood to your adult life. Uh -huh. That kind of shaped you into the person you are today. Okay. So is it about my behavior or is it about, can you specify what exactly you want me to say? I think in general, like, um, is there any, I think that you should, okay, how I see this, I ask you a question and you just say the first things that, that come to your mind. mind. Yeah, because I think if you think about it too much. Okay, uh, for some reason, the first thing that comes to my mind is discipline. I don't know how, I guess that's very much what my childhood was all about. So discipline. And I think you really are really disciplined. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think I'm really disciplined, sometimes too much. <laughs> so I guess discipline is a big thing that I've been instilled in me since childhood. Um, I want to say that I'm a really honest person. Um, I would say I've answered this already in my Instagram as well, but the thing that comes to my mind is integrity. Mm -hmm. That's something that I've been uh, raised with is um, being, I guess, loyal to whatever values that you have um, and being integral in your behavior and your words and your actions so i guess that would be something that i took away from my childhood and um a third thing education i don't know studying reading <laughs> and how were you at school oh i was a big nerd i was really nerdy i loved studying 
Uh, I wasn't forced to study because I truly enjoyed the process of studying and learning something new. I was never a popular kid, never ever. Um, not in high school, not in middle school. I never dated anyone in school. <laughs> that sounds so sad. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I was, yeah, I guess I didn't realize that I wasn't popular because I guess I was so busy studying and really taking part in different kind of competitions and really priding myself in being a really good learner. So I really didn't think that being popular was important. That's why whoever is watching this video and is in high school or middle school and is not popular and you are thinking that oh my god why i'm not like um you might think that that's the most important thing at that point in your life but i assure you that's not and even if you weren't uh, the star in high school you can definitely become a star in your adult life um you're a young mom and how would you describe motherhood has affected changed or shaped you to the person you are today again uh, maybe some core things okay so uh, i yeah i am a, i i became a mom when i was 24 um so that is quite young based on some you know more western world if we compare it but it's quite i guess regular here in azerbaijan um to get married quite early uh and to be a young mother so i guess having a community of other young moms have really helped me to go through this journey together with them uh, in a much smoother way, I would say. Um, but things that have changed me as a person is that I've, became, I've become more fearful of things. Whereas before I would do things that were more risky and I would be um, taking decisions just for myself. Nowadays, when I do any kind of, I want to take any kind of action, I have to think about them before doing that. So definitely more fearful of life, um, more cautious about a lot of things, which I wasn't ever before. Um, and realizing that you have this responsibility for the rest of your life um, no matter how old you are and your kids are so your child might be 50 year old but it's gonna still be your child, your child yeah. uh, so I guess being fearful cautious but also realizing that um, you can contribute in one way or another to growing certain individuals and shaping their minds uh, which is kind of the artistic part of being a mother uh, which I truly love, but I also um, sometimes, on a, I, I would say on a daily basis, whenever I make a decision about certain things, I always think twice how that would affect them in the long run. Um, so it is, it is a fun journey, but there's a lot uh, that you have to take into account. So being a parent is a very responsible thing. <laughs> have you ever experienced uh, postpartum depression? Um, yes, I have, especially with my first child, uh, because I was going for a natural uh, birth, but I wasn't able to deliver. Um, and so I had to do an emergency C-section, which really affected me mentally, uh, because when you get your mind fixated into something that you're going to do it a certain way, and then life happens and things get into way, um, and then realizing that I wasn't able to do it myself uh, really made me very upset about myself and my capabilities as a woman. Um, so I did have um, postpartum depression, but um, again, thanks to family and friends, I was able to overcome it um, in, I would say, in half half a year, like seven, eight months. Of course, it, it went, it lingered on the feeling for quite a while, but I think as the baby started growing and started recognizing me and she was more responsive, then things start changing and I started mm -hmm. forgetting those things. Um, so yeah. Uh, I did definitely have it, not with the second, but with the first one I did. I think we spoke about it uh, quite in a, in a quite broad way on mm -hmm. my podcast mm -hmm. with you, and you mentioned the same reason. Mm -hmm. And um, I said it back then, and I'm, I really want to say it now again, um, for any moms-to-be or the ones who went through the same experience. I'm not a mom yet, but I really want to emphasize and highlight the fact that I think we as women we don't really realize what miracles we are doing like life is created within us we create life and when we let um, things like the, the the reason that you mentioned for your postpartum depression affect us I think it it can I mean it's not right mm -hmm. because we have to think first and foremost about the fact, miraculous fact that is going on 
within our body and with our body and in our mind. I mean, it, it just, it breaks my heart, honestly, to see, because just recently I had another podcast with a very good friend of ours, um, Farah, uh, we discussed motherhood particularly, and she said the same, the very same thing, that she also had this in mind, that she went through, um, she, she wanted to go through natural uh, birth, but life happened and it didn't work, and she was questioning herself as a woman, mm -hmm. which is, to oh, yeah. me, is, uh, is, is, I don't know, it's unacceptable to treat ourselves this way. And To be honest, I think like I thought about it for a really long time because I thought like so many women go through C-section planned and they're dealing with it so well. Um, I think it really depends on how you set your mind into doing something. I was so fixated on the fact that I'll, I'm going to deliver with a natural birth that not being able to follow through that plan like I've always done throughout my life with education and college and things that I've done I've always planned and achieved then this time I wasn't able to achieve it um, again because I was at fault that's mm -hmm. how I felt um, so that really changed my like I would guilt myself for not being able to do what I intended to do in the beginning and I think also um, I don't want to blame everyone or like the media out there or uh, you know uh, whoever creates this kind of um, idea that a real mother is the one that gives birth through natural mm -hmm. birth and is the one that is breastfeeding mm -hmm. and is the one that you know, does a certain things. Um, of course, it's great if you have this ability to do that. That's again a nature's gift to you. But even if you are someone who's not able to do that, um, it's okay it's and okay. you're still a mother and you're still a woman and not being able to do that means that, you know, certain people are not capable of doing that and it's also okay um, Absolutely. so yeah it took me a while to realize it but um, I'm glad yeah, that it, I'm... it just it breaks my heart because I remember uh, specifically you, you said that um, I felt I didn't feel like a real mom mm -hmm. because I didn't go through certain experiences I felt like I had to go through pain yeah. to call myself mother and it really breaks my heart and I hope you don't think that way anymore. Not anymore. No. You're Not a anymore. lovely, lovely mommy. Thank you. Are you an anxious person? And if yes, how do you cope with your anxiety? Huh. Um, I am an anxious person, but you can never tell. <laughs> that sounds so creepy. I but, think, but I think that's, that's the thing about anxious people. Yeah, you can never tell. But um, I am an anxious person, that's true. But I've learned to control my emotions. Um, it is a lot of work for me internally because I have to be able to control it inside without letting others know about it. Um, but I guess the, the only way I've learned to cope with it is try to occupy my mind with things other than what keeps me anxious. Um, I, again, sometimes they say it's not so good to distract yourself because you have to deal with your thoughts. But I found that the more I try to deal with the thoughts that make me anxious, the more I get into this roller coaster of emotions and then I can't get myself out of it. Mm -hmm. um, so my way of coping with it is trying not to go very deep into that. I let the thought happen, I kind of let it go, um, and then I try to occupy my mind with things that I enjoy doing. Um, it might be baking or doodling or dancing or going out to meet a friend so that I don't get stuck in that thought and that loophole of mm -hmm. negative uh, thinking and getting anxious more and more. Of course, having kids also makes you an anxious human being because as I mentioned before, things that would never get into your mind or preoccupy you before, they start getting into your mind and you start thinking, imagining things. Yeah, I guess my way of coping with things is trying to avoid thoughts that make me anxious. But do you think that's the right choice of like avoiding? Do you think that's the right thing to do? Because uh, when you avoid something, it's still there, but you just try to like yeah, go you're... beyond it. But mm -hmm. I think at the end of the day, you're still, you're still meeting with these thoughts in your head, right? I am, but this is the, okay, this is the way I think about it. It's like um, having bad people in your life or people that don't bring joy in you when you meet them. So instead of trying to bump into them all the time, you kind of avoid them that doesn't, their existence doesn't cease, they're still there, but you try not to see them so that it doesn't get into your, it doesn't somehow influence your mood. I guess, I guess maybe it's not right uh, to avoid these thoughts, but knowing myself, 
and knowing that that's the only way I can handle this. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to avoid people that don't bring me joy in my life and that's the way I handle those people, the rude people and the bad energy people and I try to avoid um, thoughts that make me anxious. Um, speaking of joy, mm -hmm. what sparks joy in you? And so many things. I mean, I, it's pretty easy, I think, for me to get excited or feel joyful about things because um, I get very motivated. I get motivated quickly uh, and I get inspired pretty quickly. Uh, very little things can get me inspired, like a cup of coffee, <laughs> uh, a scented candle. Which I honestly think is a gift. Yeah, to thank be you. Uh, yeah, uh, some Pinterest pictures, your blog. Uh, looking up your pictures, I really am. Um, I guess your pictures. <laughs> I'm sitting and scrolling your pictures, but really, your I think your blog is so warm that whenever I'm not in a good mood, I can just scroll through your pictures and really feel joyful. Thank like, you. yeah, it's not a compliment, but I actually mean it. So for me, I think a lot of things spark joy: my kids, my family, um, my home. Sometimes even just getting into your bed that's warm and nice, warm slippers can bring a lot of joy. True. Um, do you have any phobias? And mm -hmm. what's your biggest fear? Uh, I do have. Uh, a thing that's a very weird one, it's called agoraphobia, which means the fear of crowded places. I have, I yeah, have it too. You yeah. have it too? Um, I never used to have it, but once when I was a kid, I was attending a big concert by this Turkish uh, singer who was big in Azerbaijan, and I remember that I was stuck in the crowd, and a part of the police were closing the door, the gates, and the other crowd from the back was trying to get in, and I was stuck in the middle, and I felt the pressure from both sides and that really sparked the fear in me. Mm -hmm. And ever since, I'm really crowded of attending concerts with really big arenas. Um, if I do, I would try to take a place that's really close to the gates. Uh, I will never be in the center. So that's something that's a real fear in me. And I'm also claustrophobic. I'm really scared of really closed small spaces. I remember once we were in Egypt with my parents and really wanted to see this tomb of this pharaoh and we had to go down yeah, yeah. and oh I just God, couldn't. That's my nightmare. Yeah, I just couldn't. Uh, I'm also sometimes scared of getting into elevators when there's a lot of people and um, I tend to get claustrophobic in airplanes as well but then again that anxious thought I try to think of other things mm -hmm. to try to avoid the thought that makes me anxious. Um, and I'm really scared of little rats and mouse, like mm -hmm. all that little creatures like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And what would you call your biggest fear? Um, again, this will sound cliche, but of course, after being a mother, the biggest fear that you have is all about related to your children. Um, again, the thoughts that I try to avoid as much as I can. Uh, fear of losing loved ones and the people that you care about, especially after everything that's happening in the world these days. I guess the biggest fear is losing someone and um, I'm not scared of losing things um, because I know that with a good health and with everyone who is there to support you and love you, you can always regain things in your life. Uh, but with health and just the being of someone around you, that's something that I treasure the most. You have a very wide uh, audience in terms of age range. So if you could give uh, advice to your younger audience, let's say teenagers, what would it be? So the first thing I would say that has uh, helped me in my life is definitely investing in your education. Uh, that means, you know, chasing studies rather than other things that might preoccupy your mind when you're a teenager. As I mentioned earlier, I was never popular in school. Um, I was always, you know, studying and trying to um, be the best I could in given subjects. So at the time, maybe um, I wasn't really enjoying other aspects of teenage life. But looking back, I think I did the right thing because the things that I thought were important um, actually mattered when I became an adult. So I would say investing in your education is the most important if you're watching this video. That's something no one can ever take away from you, no matter what. Um, 
I would say, especially given the social media now, how you know teenagers are all on TikTok and Instagram, and they're really worried when their likes are not in the right amount that they expect them to be. Um, just thinking that you know one day you might wake up in the world where there's no TikTok, there's no social media. So all these things are actually a reality that we have created, but they can easily be taken away from us, and they would mean nothing, nothing mm -hmm. in a physical world. Um, so I would say, you know, don't get worried about getting likes and getting, um, I don't know, I guess, f f I don't know, followers, becoming popular on social media as a teenager, um, because this is the time when you can grow your mind and grow your soul uh, in the most fruitful way that you can, that can actually bring a lot of uh, value to your life as an adult. Do you have a team that stands behind your channel? Um, I do have a team. Uh, which is comprised of me, my videographer Rufat, and his sister Amal, who is in charge of editing the videos and creating the thumbnails for my videos. So it's a family business. <laughs> um, yeah, and I've also talked about it on my video about how I grew my channel. So you can see all the questions related to launching your YouTube channel on that video. How do you maintain a balance between your work, your YouTube channel, um, your family and your me time? I guess the most important thing about my work is the fact that I'm able to do my own schedule. So I plan my work around the schedule that is suitable for me. I have quit my job in school where I was teaching last year or before pandemic um, and then we switched online and then I decided that I would just want to keep all my classes online for the time being. Um, and that way I can plan all my workshops that I conduct privately over Zoom uh, based on the time that I allocate to those particular sessions, online sessions. Um, for the YouTube shooting, I allocate the time and a date whenever it's suitable to me. So I'm in charge of creating my own schedule, uh, which is something that gives me a lot of flexibility. So when my kids are in school, I have that time to dedicate to my work and writing and classes. And then when they come home, then I have time to dedicate to them as well. So my job is not very fixed from nine to six. And also with being a creator, you can have two, three days just back to back shooting, you know, having workshops and doing all that. Mm -hmm. And then I can take two days off and just do nothing while the work that I've been working on is being edited, is being uh, created and uploaded and all that. So it definitely gives me a lot of flexibility. And I also do have help, which is, I think, important to, to mention uh, because a lot of the people that get to see this, um, you know, this woman being thinking, how is she a mom, a working person? How does she manage to do household chores? And I think it's important to mention that I do have help and that gives me a lot of uh, room uh, then to spend some time with my kids and then spend time to dedicate to myself mm -hmm. and to my readings and to things that bring me joy. Uh, this question is an additional one. It's from me. Um, to someone who works uh, in a corporate um, industry, nine to six, sometimes nine to eternity, whatever. Um, what advice would you give um, in terms of the bad, like keeping the balance? Honestly, I think it would be unfair to me to give that advice because I have never ever worked Working in a corporate, corporate environment. So I don't know what it is to work from nine to six. I've always worked as a teacher. Um, I've worked in two places at a university and school as a teacher, but both part-time. So if you combine those hours, it was full-time. But then again, I got to select the hours mm -hmm. that I wanted to teach. Um, and usually schools and universities, they run from nine to four. So I didn't have any evening classes. Uh, this, that's why I think it's very, would be unhonest for me, um, dishonest, sorry, <laughs> dishonest for me to say, give an advice because I've never been mm -hmm. in that environment. Um, but I have a lot of respect for women that are able to balance home life, family life and corporate work because, you know, given that we women are expected to do so many things at home, mm -hmm. it is a lot on your shoulders when you have to try to find a balance. And honestly, I've read that, you know, this idea that we need to find a perfect balance is very unfair on itself because trying to keep that balance, we also get anxious about mm -hmm. keeping it. So I think the best way is to try to live it and you know on certain days your family will be your priority on other days it will be your work mm -hmm. and it might be 
not always be balanced in a certain day, but if you manage both, then good job. What made you want to be in a public eye? Um, because having thousands and thousands of people watching you, um, your life, um, it can be exhausting sometimes. Uh, I mean, I know you're not disclosing that much of your personal life, but just, you know, um, showing yourself um, to the world, um, it can be, uh, it can cause some anxiety, especially if you're an anxious person. So um, how did you even decide to, you know, open, uh, make your Instagram profile open to public, then YouTube channel, um, and did it ever cause anxiety for you? Mm, well, the thing is, I you know about the journey because uh, you were with me from day one when I was thinking about doing an a public, having an Instagram that would be public. Um, I didn't even think of YouTube back then. It was just having an Instagram that was public. Um, the idea actually came when I was uh, teaching the course internationally. I would do workshops here and there. I'd meet a lot of people but uh, then I wouldn't be able to keep in touch with them or they wouldn't be able to keep in touch with me only through email which of course is great in the beginning but then you kind of forget uh, the person's email forget to respond to email mm -hmm. so I wanted to keep in touch with my students and I wanted them to keep in touch with me so that was an idea of you know having a public Instagram page and also sharing my thoughts with people and uh, students and the world I guess um, but I was really hesitant because I was scared of that invasion of privacy. Um, I uh, answered this question again in one of my Q&As on Instagram is that I love the fact that with social media and with YouTube, you choose what you want to show. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not a big A-star celebrity where I'm chased by paparazzi. I'm just a person that has um, a big following on YouTube and rather a small one on Instagram and I get to choose what I want to show to them. So if you watch my other YouTube videos you can see that these are purely educational or they're based on things that are interesting to me and I want to share about my culture to my viewers um, and I'm not feeling pressure to share anything about my private life. Um, again, I'm not chasing, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not chasing any likes or followers. So I'm not trying to deliver the material that would get me that mm -hmm. much attention. I just want to be as um, educational, informative and useful to my audience as much as I can. Uh, with that being said, I do get sometimes anxious when I get uh, hateful messages uh, and I do get them uh, from time to time. I don't want to focus just on the negative parts because I do receive a lot of love and support from my audience which I truly uh, appreciate and I always answer as much as I can to every single one of them who, who tells me that you know I inspire them or I've changed their lives in one way or another. Uh, but I do get sometimes really, um, I think I think unjustfully hateful messages and comments that do spark some kind of an anxiety in me that makes me think I want to close everything and just shut myself down from everyone. Uh, but then I think about all those that you know find um, some kind of use in my channel, mm -hmm. and I think okay, no, that's that wouldn't be fair towards those that have been so loving and caring towards me. But I guess the only way I could say for whoever is thinking of opening their YouTube channel or Instagram public is that you have full control over your page and you don't have to feel pressured to share something that you don't feel is true to your uh, moral values or to your um, identity. Uh, just share what you like and what you think is going to be good for your audience without feeling pressured to be liked by anyone. I completely agree. Um, what inspires you the most? Uh, every day or just people or... I don't know, in general. What inspires me the most? Uh, I would say successful people inspire me the most. Um, and I always read biographies or watch documentaries about certain people that I admire or people that I've never heard about uh, and just stumble upon a video that talks about the life of a certain successful person because I think these are real lessons that you can mm -hmm. learn from and get truly inspired um, because oftentimes you think you know the road to success is just so easy there were there was this they were in this place and then the next thing you think is they're bit they're big and they're so popular but you never really get to see the whole journey. Um, and sometimes you think, oh, I would do it too, but perhaps that journey was so rough that you wouldn't even ever want to have that journey in your life. So I think uh, for me, the most inspiring thing that I, I 
I do to myself is I watch documentaries about successful people and watch biog and read biographies about those people and then get me inspired to to kind of stay disciplined, try to achieve things that I've set my mind to. Um, so and just have a lot of admiration to people that were able to do things in life that they've always wanted to do. Do you consider yourself a successful person? Uh, I think yes. Uh, I wouldn't. Well, it, success is very uh, subjective. I think if you compare me with uh, Madonna or someone else, um, of course, I'm not successful if you look at that spectrum of success but I think I am successful in things that I've set my mind into so those little steps that I have wanted always to do and um, you know some things that was a dream for me is to write a book and fast forward five years I have two books and even small things like I never knew how to ride a bike and I learned how to bike in my late 20s and that's also a success for me so mm -hmm. success I think comes in small and big things and if I were to look at the bigger picture, then I would say I am successful. But there are, of course, some more things that I want to succeed in. I remember back in 2019, when you just published your first book, uh, we had this long, long conversation. I think we were sitting in that cafe for like five hours, um, where I was pushing you to speak out, speak out loud about um, your book, because at least in our, Jamila didn't have her Instagram page back then or a YouTube channel. It was just the book. And I really wanted her to do this whole presentation about this book and everything. And you were very hesitant back then. So do you think that, um, uh, you know, fast forward to these days today, do you think that uh, changed in you? Like, are, do you still feel hesitant speaking out loud about your own success, um, the fact that you wrote this book and like, do you still feel this um, hesitation inside? I think, um, I guess it depends on what I would want to, like, I wouldn't want to talk about just the book. Um, or do an entire presentation about my YouTube channel. Um, I think I'm still hesitant of sharing a certain success in one particular field and you know making a, a big deal in a way about it. Um, that's why I said if I were to look at a bigger picture then I would say I'm a successful person um, and that bigger picture comprises of a lot of other things like you know learning to bike, starting to learn how to ski, writing a book, doing a YouTube channel but I am still hesitant about doing an entire presentation about just my YouTube journey. Mm -hmm. um, I take a lot of pride in everything that I do in YouTube and books, but I'm still, I don't know, I don't want to say shy because I'm not really a shy person, but I guess there is some shyness in me that doesn't let me do it, you know, publicly. <laughs> Um, in my podcast, one of the, not one of the, but actually the last question that I always ask my guests is um, what are you proud of um, in relation to your own self, like your achievement? Can you, can you name some of your achievements out loud? And um, I have different guests. Uh, all of them are, are amazing people. To me, they're inspiring and successful in any possible way. Um, but each one of them, including you back then, mm -hmm. um, are struggling uh, with um, replying to that particular one question because of some internal doubts and maybe insecurities. So if I ask you this question now, what would you say? What are you proud of um, about yourself and about your achievements? Can you name them? Um, I think now I know the answer because Back then, I guess it was just one fear that I had that I overcame at that point. That would, you know, one of the things I always wanted to do is write a book. So at the, that point, it was just only having the book written. So, but now, if I were, you know, fast forward a couple of years, having achieved things that were on my list that I was again scared to do, now having done that, I think the thing that I'm most proud of about myself is overcoming a lot of my fears when it came to achieving things. Um, I always had a lot of excuses for a lot of things, you know. I won't do a, a public profile because A, Z, B, C, all the reasons I could tell myself because I was truly just scared to do mm -hmm. that. And then when I did that, I was like, okay, that wasn't even scary at all. Mm -hmm. And so nowadays with life, with anything that I set my mind to, to achieve, I do not come with excuses. I try to think, okay, what are the certain steps that I can take in order to achieve them? So I think my biggest achievement is overcoming my fears and doing what I set my mind into. 
And the last question. So before this interview, I actually Googled Jamila just out of curiosity because I wanted to understand what people are mo mostly curious about. And the first question that I saw was, who's Jamila Musayeva's husband? So I decided to add it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because apparently your audience is very curious about that. Uh, okay. What exactly? So who is Jamila Musayeva's husband? <laughs> Do you want a picture? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to, like a video of him? Okay, so he is uh, Azerbaijani. Uh, I get a lot of questions if my kids are biracial. They are not. He is 100% Azerbaijani just like me. Um, he's four years older. Uh, I cannot disclose um, his work or his name because he's a private person and he doesn't want me to do that. Um, if he ever decides uh, that I can share, then I will. Uh, but this YouTube channel is about me, it's not about our family or it's not about him. So I think uh, I would like to keep a lot of the things about his, his personality and who he is uh, private. What I can say is that, um, and I have shared this again on my Instagram, is a lot of questions are about how we met. Um, and we met uh, at uh, their house because we were invited over as guests. Uh, our parents have known each other uh, for a really long time, but we have never actually met in person up until we were in our 20s. Um, that's when we met for the first time and that's how the story goes. Okay, thank you Jamila. That's all the questions that I picked for today's Q&A and thank you to your audience for very cool, um, inspiring questions that I think um, helped open um, your personality a bit more um, to your uh, followers. Um, and thank you again for having me um, and giving me the chance to interview you twice. Uh, thank you, Leila, for accepting my invitation. And thank you for uh, believing in me since day one. And if you like this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up and let us know in the comment section what are some other questions you'd like to ask me. And if we receive enough <laughs> likes and comments maybe we could do a second part of this q a again with leila thank you we'll thank see you. you in the next video bye 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 what advice would you give to your young younger <laughs> <laughs> younger <What>? audience <laughs> oh. i think it's called i think it's called like i didn't go to the I think it's called oh, tripophobia. Like really? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. uh, you know this. Uh, there is this phobia. It's. <laughs> 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 okay. Take a sip of this. If you're asking me, if, you're asking, <laughs> if these questions were addressed to me. <laughs> When do you think was that transitional moment for you uh, when you went from wanting to live um, this elegant lifestyle um, to actually living it? <laughs> 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 so sorry. So, so.